righty. Let's go. Okay, we are just about ready to go. Let's see if I can turn my video on. Uh oh, there we go. Okay, hello everybody. We're ready to go uh, with our Nectar Devotion Study. So first we're gonna chant Jai Radha Madhava. <clears throat> Jai Radha Madhava. Kunya Bikari Jayaran Umadhova <coughs> Kunya Bikari Gopi Janabalaba Kigiri Bharat Haguti Gopi Janabalaba Kigiri Bharat Haguti Vishodananda Brajachara Ranjana Vishodananda Brajachara Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Ranhumadhuva Kunya Bihari Jaya Ranhumad Ova Kunya Bihari Gopi Janabalaba Giri Bharadhauti Gopi Janabalaba Giri Bharadhauti Vishodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yasu Tanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Ranhamadhuva Kunya Bihari Jaya Ranho Madhuva Kunya Bihari Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahansa Paravita Gacharya Oza Tada Sitashi Shimad His Divine Grace Abhaya Chalana Bhaktivedanta Gosami Shila Prabhupad Ki Jai this gone founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada Kijai, Nantakoti, Vaishna, Vrindi Kijai, Namacharya, Srila Hila, Stako Kijai. Param Se Kaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nichananda, Shitway, Nikadad, Ha, Shibasadi Gol, Bhakta Vrindi Kijai, Shri Shri Radha Krishna. Gopi Gopi Nath, Shayam Kun Radha Kunda, Giri Govardhan Kijai. Vrindavanam Kijai, Maturam Kijai, Jayla Vasami Kijai, Yamanamai Kijai, Shimani Galasi Devi Kijai, Samaveda Bhakta Vrindi Kijai, Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Go. All glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious the assembled devotees, all glorious to the assembled devotees, all glorious to she. Guru and Gauranga, Shila Prabhupada Kijai, Tamao Vishnu Padaya. Krishna Prasthaya Bhudale Shimati Bhakta Vedanta Swamit Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Govani Charni Nirvasesha Shinyavati Pashyatya Deja Charni So, Om Ganat Kivadanda Shagadan Janala Shalakya Chachuru Meditam Nina Tasmai Shikate Kama So, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, who's kindly opened my eyes with a torch light of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So, let's chant this verse from the Goswami Yashtika. Uh, 
Nana Shastra Vichara Nika Nipano Sadharma Samstapako Lokanam Hitakara no Tree Bhuvane Manjo Shadanya Karo Radha Krishna Padara Vinda Vajana Nante Lamatali Ko Vande Rupa Sanatano Raguya Go Shi Jiva Gopala Ko I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Goswamis, namely Sri Sanatan Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. So, we are going to continue with our reading about existential ecstatic love. Existential ecstatic love, of course, uh, indicates the sattvaka bhavas. Now, if you don't remember what that is, I will explain it. So, let's go over all the bhavas again for the 10 millionth time so you can finally understand. The first bhava is the vibhava, that which stimulates your emotions. And there's two types, the lambana and the deepana. A lambana is directly Krishna, a deepana is things related to Krishna, or things that remind you of Krishna. And the next one is anubhava, that means the voluntary. Uh, emotions or activities or expressions of love that you experience upon being stimulated. The next one is Sattvika Bhava, which is constitution as part of your nature. Sometimes they come out, sometimes they don't, but they're actually an integral part of your spiritual nature. Next one is Vyavachari Bhava, which means uh, uncontrolled intermittent ecstasies. And next one is Stai Bhava, the emotion that pertains to your particular relationship with Krishna, whether it is uh, Dasharas, Sakiras, Vatsayaras, or Madhuryaras. Okay. Here we go. So we're just finishing up this chapter. I think we just have two paragraphs left in this chapter about existential ecstatic love, or what's called Astasattvaka Bhava, or Sattva Bhavas, Sattvaka Bhavas. Sometimes it is found that when staunch let me just make sure that the microphone is right here. Yeah, microphone is right. Okay, everything is right. Uh, sometimes it is found that when staunch logicians, without any trace of devotional service and without understanding the transcendental glories of the Lord, sit down to hear the glories of the Lord, they appear to be melting and shedding tears. In this connection, there's a statement by a devotee who addresses the Lord thus. My dear Makunda, I cannot properly express the glories of your pastimes. Even when the non-devotees hear of your glorious pastimes, they become affected and shed tears and start to tremble. Such non-devotees are not actually melted, they are hard-hearted, but the influence of the glories of the Lord is so great that even the non-devotees sometimes shed tears. And this is what I mentioned before. Even if someone is not Krishna conscious, they can experience some of these emotions by the association with a pure devotee by hearing the holy names and ecstatic kirtan, or by hearing something from the Vedic literatures about Krishna from a devotees, not from demons. Sometimes, <laughs> sorry about that. Sometimes it is found that a non devotee who has practically no taste for Krishna and who follows no rules or regulations that can by practice make a show of devotional symptoms, even crying in an assembly of devotees. This shedding of tears is not actually an ecstatic loving expression, however. It is done simply by practice. Although there is no need to describe these reflections of ecstatic love, Rupa Goswami gives some instances where there is no actual devotional service and such expressions are manifested. Now, why would one manifest them? For attention. Just like a child will manifest a tantrum for attention. Because people want to imitate devotees, and they see devotees are getting so much 
adoration, distinction, and profit, and everything, so they imitate. Okay, next we're going to get to the 33 Vyabhachari Bhavas, which I mentioned in the beginning of class. Vyabhachari means intermittent ecstatic symptoms, and these are the most intense of all the symptoms of ecstatic love. These are the symptoms that the devotee has no control over. These are the symptoms that come out or come out without any sort of warning. These are the symptoms that overwhelm one so that you lose control. I said that already. But and not only do you have no control over when they're expressed, but you lose control once they are expressed. So these are called Vyabhachari Babas. And this will be explained by Prabhupada. So the chapter 29 is expressions of love for Krishna. There are some bodily symptoms which express overwhelming ecstatic love, as I mentioned before, Vyabhi Chai Baba. They are counted, sometimes Vyabhi Chai is described as Sanchari, but it's, a, it's the same thing. They are counted at 33 as follows. Disappointment, lamentation, humility, guilt, fatigue, intoxication, doesn't mean marijuana, <laughs> pride, uh, doubt, apprehension, intense emotion, madness, forgetfulness, disease, confusion, death, laziness, inertness, bashfulness, concealment, remembrance, argumentativeness, anxiety, thoughtfulness, endurance, happiness, eagerness, violence, haughtiness, envy, impudence, dizziness, sleepiness, and alertness. Now, you may say some of these are kind of repetitive with other ones that you've heard in the past. Especially they may be uh, repetitive with the Asthasatvika Bhavas or with the Anubhavas. But the difference is these are, cannot be controlled, they're much more intense, and you never know when they're coming. They're in, in, intermittent. Whereas the, the sattvic above is always there, as part of your nature. Sometimes they come up, sometimes they don't come up, but they're always part of your nature. Where these are completely uncontrolled, completely intermittent, intermittent. you don't know when they're coming up, and you can't do anything about them. <laughs> Disappointment. When one is forced to act in a way which is forbidden, or to refrain from acting in a way which is proper, he becomes regretful and thinks himself dishonored. At that time, there's a sense of disappointment. In this kind of disappointment, one becomes full of anxiety, sheds tears, changes bodily color, feels humility, and breathes heavily. Now, some of these you may recognize from the previous symptoms. When Krishna, in punishing the Kaliya serpent, appeared to have drowned himself in the poisonous water of the Yamuna, Nanda Maharaj addressed Yashoda Devi thus, my dear wife, <coughs> excuse me, that's not a symptom of ecstasy. Krishna has gone deep into the water, and so there is no longer any need to maintain our bodies, which are so full of sinful activities. Let us also enter into the poisonous water of the Yamuna and compensate for the sinful activities of our lives. This is an instance of severe shock wherein the devotee becomes greatly disappointed. In other words, this is so intense. So, what is the stimulation? Krishna going into the water. There's the stimulation, the vibhava. And the uh, <coughs> vyabhichari bhava was the desire to leave your body, basically. When Krishna left Vrindavan, Subal, his intimate friend, decided to leave also. While leaving, Subal was contemplating that without Krishna, there was no longer any pleasure to be found in Vrindavana. The analogy is given that as the bees go away from a flower that has no honey, Subal left Vrindavan when he found that there was no longer any relishable transcendental pleasure there. Disappointment. Changed his whole life, which is really dramatic, because Krishna wasn't there. In the Dana Kelly Komadi, hmm. Shimati Radharani addresses one of her friends in this manner. <clears throat> My dear friend, if I cannot hear of the glorious activities of Krishna, it is better for me to become deaf. And because I am now unable to see him, it would be good for me to be a blind woman. This is another instance of disappointment due to separation from Krishna. So you, these are 
very severe, even psychological uh, manifestations. I mean, usually if someone was feeling like that, I wish I was deaf, I wish I was blind, you probably have to see a psychiatrist at that point. So this is called Vivion Mada. Mada means like madness or illusion. Vivian means uh, transcendental. There's a statement in the Hari Vamsa wherein Satyabhama, one of the queens of Krishna and Dwarka, tells her husband, my dear Krishna, since I heard Narada glorifying Rukmini before you, I can understand there's no need of talking, of any talking about myself. <laughs> there's an instance of disappointment caused by envy. Rukmini and Satyabhama were co-wives, and because Krishna was husband of both, there was naturally some feminine envy between them. So when Satyabhama heard the glories of Rukmini, she was envious of her and thus became disappointed. So try to understand this is not mundane envy where you hate someone. This is like fun competition. Try to understand. They are having fun. It is not hatefulness. Envy in this world is hatefulness. In the 10th canto, 51st chapter, I'm going to give an example of that. This uh, Duryodhana, who is very hateful towards the Pandavas because the Pandavas were far more qualified than him. So because he was so hateful, he had his wonderful uncle Shakuni. He tried to kill the Pandavas in so many ways. And actually, one time, he even sent them on vacation to Barnabat. Uh, to live in a house that was made of flammable substances, and he wanted to burn them all to death. Fortunately, they were able to escape by a tunnel because of their uncle Vidura. So that is envy. Whereas Satyabhama would never attack Rukmini. She's just feeling competitive, and that com competition is a beautiful symptom. Like Prabhupada encouraged competition between the devotees. Or one way that Prabhupada encouraged competition between the devotees was in uh, book distribution. He said, where whoever would distribute the most books or whatever temple where the most books were distributed, uh, he would go to that place and reside in that place. So we were had continually having competition. In the 10th canto, 51st chapter, and I'll tell you one funny story about that personal story, is that we were competing one year we means me and the temple I was in charge of in South America, the Caracas, Venezuela. We were competing one year against the Radha Damodar party that was headed up by Tamal Krishna Maharaj. And we won at Evolve. And when Prabhupada uh, heard that, he made this famous statement that Tamal does not like to get defeated. So we were having this friendly competition because it's all based on pleasing Prabhupada. It wasn't based on showing myself better than someone else. It was based upon who can please Prabhupada the most. And you appreciate the other person. You glorify the other person. Uh, my dear Krishna, I cannot say that it is only other people who are implicated in material existence because I am too much entangled with the bodily concept of life. I am always too anxious about my family, home, wife, wealth, land, and kingdom. And because I have been so maddened by this material atmosphere, I'm thinking now that my life has been simply spoiled. This is a statement. This statement is an instance of disappointment caused by lamentation. According to Bharatamuni, uh, Bharatamuni was one of the great scholars before the six Goswamis of Vrindavan who developed this elaborate uh, rasa theology. Uh, Anyway, the rest of the theology means the different tastes and different relationships. And he was quite a dramatist. Uh, according to Bartamuni, this disappointment is inauspicious, but as there are other learned scholars who have accepted such disappointment as being in the mood of neutrality and as being a preservative of ecstatic love. Yes. So Bartamuni, Muni, uh, he wasn't exactly a pure devotee, as you know. Because the disappointment that's listed above is not actually inauspicious. It's a symptom of ecstasy. Lamentation. When one is unsuccessful in achieving his desired goal of life, when one finds no fulfillment in his present occupation, when one finds himself in reverse conditions, and when one feels guilt, at such time one is said to be in a state of lamentation. Shoot. 
In this condition of lamentation, one becomes questioning, thoughtful, tearful, regretful, and heavy breathing. His bodily color changes and his mouth becomes dry. So you see this sort of lamentation in material life as well as spiritual life. So it's not that when you're experiencing this sort of lamentation in material life, it's spiritual. No. But it has to be centered on Krishna. Krishna has to be the the ball. The stimulation. When Krishna's the stimulation, then it's spiritual. When someone else is your stimulation, like your boyfriend or girlfriend or country. <laughs> oh my God, I should give an example. So I, anyway, I'll give you an example. It's about myself. So the, this morning I woke up, of course I did wake up this morning, and uh, one of the things I did after I chanted was I checked to see who had won the election in the United States. And so you know, because all the votes weren't in, so it was apparent that one person won the election, whereas he actually didn't. So actually, <laughs> I became thoughtful, tearful, regretful, and I started breathing heavily. And my bodily color changed, and my mouth became very dry. But later on, I discovered he hadn't won. But anyway, so that's material. <laughs> anyway, it's got a good material example. One aged devotee of Krishna addressed him in this way. My dear Krishna, O killer of the demon Aga, my body is now invalid due to old age. I cannot speak very fluently. My voice is faltering. That's poetic, faltering. My mind is not strong, and I am often attacked by forgetfulness. But my dear Lord, you are just like the moonlight, and my only real regret is that for want of any taste for your pleasant shining, I did not advance myself in Krishna consciousness. This statement is an instance of lamentation due to one's being unable to achieve the desired goal. That's pretty heavy. You know, you're old, and you see how much time you wasted in your human form of life, and you're lamenting about it. Of course, that lamentation, or lamentation, is actually purification. One devotee said, this night I was dreaming of collecting various flowers from the garden. And I was thinking of making a garland to offer to Krishna. But I am so unfortunate that all of a sudden my dream was over and I could not achieve my desired goal. This statement is an instance of lamentation resulting from non fulfillment of one's duties. That's a wonderful dream. When Nanda Maharaj saw his foster son, Krishna, embarrassed in the sacrificial arena of Tongsi, he said, How unfortunate I am that I did not keep my son bolted within a room. Unfortunately, I brought him to Mathura, and now I see that he's embarrassed by this giant elephant named Kuvalya. It is as though the moon of Krishna were eclipsed by the shadow of the earth. This is an instance of lamentation caused by reversed conditions. And that was really heavy because he was so attached to Krishna. I mean, you can't believe how attached a pure devotee is to Krishna. And he thought Krishna was going to die. And this is Krishna's plan to bring out these emotions from his devotees. And of course, Krishna just took this elephant and killed him in a second. That's another story. The 10th canto, 14th chapter, verse 9 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's a statement by Brahma. My dear Lord, just see my impudence. You are the unlimited, the original personality of God in the super soul, and you rule over the most perfect illusory energies. And just see my impudence. Hmm. He's repeating. I wanted to supersede you by my own personal power, and I was very puffed up with this tiny power of mine. It means proud. Translating the word puffed up means proud. Just as a simple spark from a fire cannot do any harm to the fire, so my bewildering potency was completely unsuccessful in thwarting your superior illusory power. Therefore, I find myself to be most insignificant and think of myself as a most useless person. This statement by Brahma is an instance of lamentation caused by committing an offense. Humility. A sense of weakness caused by distress, fear, or offensiveness is called humility. In such a humbled condition, one becomes talkative, small in heart, dirty in mind, and full of anxiety and inactive. 
I think we've all experienced that. You know, like you, if you make some mistake, big mistake, you actually even start talking to yourself. Oh, what an idiot I was! I mean, that's what, you know, how can I have done such a thing? You know, oh my God! So that's <laughs> distress, fear, or offensiveness. In the tenth canto, fifty-first chapter, uh, verse fifty-seven of the Shrimad Bhagavatam, there's the following statement by King Muchu Kunda: "My dear Lord." Because of my bad deeds in the past, I am everlastingly aggrieved. I am always suffering from my desires, but still my senses are never satisfied with material enjoyments. Somehow or other, by your grace, I am now in a peaceful condition because I have taken shelter of your lotus feet, which are always free from all lamentation, fear, and death. O Supreme Protector, O Supreme Soul, O Supreme Controller, kindly give me your protection. Uh oh, someone has a question. Let me finish this paragraph. I am so much embarrassed. This statement by Muchakunda is an instance of humility resulting from a severely miserable condition of material existence. Let's see who asked the question. Oh, someone just has to leave. Okay. Goodbye, Chaitanya had to leave to go to work. So sorry you have to leave. When Uttara was attacked, by the Brahmastra of Ashwatthama, she became afraid of losing her child, Maharaj Pariksit, who was still within the womb. She immediately surrendered to Krishna and said, My dear Lord, kindly save my child. I do not mind if I myself must be killed by the Brahmastra of Ashwatthama. This is an instance of humility caused by fear. So Brahmastra is an atomic weapon, but an atomic weapon that can be focused just on one tiny little point or one person and not harm anyone else in its path or next to it. That's pretty heavy. And so Krishna protected the uh, embryo in her womb. And the embryo in her womb, that was Maharaj Pariksit. It wasn't Maharaj Pariksit at that time because he wasn't a king in the, as an embryo. But he protected the embryo and Pariksit Maharaj actually saw Krishna and that's why he was called Pariksit. He was always looking for Krishna for the rest of his life. In the 10th canto, 14th chapter, verse 10, of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Brahma says, O infallible one, I am born in the mode of passion, and therefore I have been falsely proud of being the creator of this material world. My false pride was just like dense darkness, and in this darkness I had become blind. In my blindness I was considering myself a competitor to you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but my dear Lord, even though I am accepted as the creator of this universe, I am eternally your servant. Therefore, kindly, always be compassionate toward me and excuse me in that way. This statement by Rama is another instance of humility resulting from committing an offense. Anybody can make a mistake, but it takes a great person to admit it and beg for forgiveness and make some compensation. There's several ways to deal with a mistake or an offense against someone. You admit it. First, admit it to yourself, admit it to others, beg for forgiveness, and do something that shows you actually are feeling humble and remorseful. Sometimes there's humility due to shyness. For example, when Krishna stole all the garments from the gopis while they were bathing in the river, all of them begged Krishna not to commit this injustice upon them. The gopis addressed him thus, Dear Krishna, we know that you are the son of Nanda Maharaj and that you are the most beloved of all Vrindavana. And you are very much loved by us also. But why are you giving us this trouble? Kindly return our garments. Just see how we are trembling from the severe cold. This humility was due to their shyness from being naked before Krishna. Actually, if someone did that today, that you would get arrested for it. So anyway, uh, so... The story behind this is actually quite interesting. That the gopis, they perform this brat, this vow called Kachiyani brat, in which they just ate unspiced food, havisha, uh, and basically bathed in the cold Yamuna River every day. And really, a lot of austerities. Why do they perform all these austerities? Because they wanted to have a husband. And actually, many girls in India do that today, perform this Katyani Brat. Katyana is a form of Durga. Who gives you a good husband? 
So I know someone who performed Kachiani Brat, and they got a husband right away. I know a man who begged from a desire tree to get a wife, and he got a wife right away. Just be careful what you ask for. Anyway, so the gopis were doing this Kachiani Brat, and then when they finished the Brat, the last day, and they were bathing in the river, and they had put their clothes by the side, Krishna actually stole their clothes and held it up in the tree. And he had, was playing his flute, he was up in the tree. And the girls were just like shivering. They couldn't come out. They didn't want to be exposed. And Krishna said, come out and get your clothes. You committed a great offense by bathing naked in the river. So come out. And they came, eventually they came out and they tried to cover themselves. And Krishna said, you know, put your hands above your head and beg for forgiveness. And anyway, so this is all a trick by Krishna uh, to signify that he was actually married to all the girls. And actually he was married to all the girls because he got married when he took the form of the coward boys during the year in which Lord Brahma stole the coward boys and the calves. Uh, and those coward boys got married to the coward girls, the gopis at that time. So Krishna was, in essence, getting married to all the gopis. No one else could marry the gopis except for Krishna. Okay, guilt. Here's another one. And as we mentioned, people do experience these emotions in the material world. But when they're connected to Krishna, especially if you are a pure devotee or a very advanced devotee, they are symptoms of this ecstasy called Vyabhachari ecstasy. It's not part of your nature, but they come out intermittently, ecstatically, uncontrollably. When a person blames himself for committing an inappropriate action, his feeling is, feeling is called guilt. I know there's a certain religion that people feel guilty all the time. Anyway. One day, Srimati Radharani was churning yogurt for Krishna. At that time, the jeweled bangles in her hands were circling around, and she was also chanting the holy name of Krishna. All of a sudden, remember, she's chanting the holy name of Krishna in front of her mother-in-law and sister-in-law. Oh, my God. You can imagine, like, a, a lady who's doing something in the kitchen, and she's chanting the name of a boyfriend that she has, and she's actually married, and her husband's mother her husband's sister are listening. All of a sudden she thought, I am chanting the holy name of Krishna. And my superiors, my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, may hear me. By this thought, Radharani became over-anxious. This is an instance of feeling guilty because of devotion to Krishna. One day, the beautiful-eyed Srimati Radharani entered into the forest to collect some flowers to prepare a garland for Krishna. While collecting the flowers, she became afraid that someone might see her and she felt some fatigue and weakness. This is an instance of guilty feelings caused by labor for Krishna. <laughs> so wonderful. There's a statement in the Radha, Ras, sorry, Rasa Sudakara that after passing the night with Krishna, Radharani became so weak that she was unable to get up from bed. When Krishna took her hand to help her, Radharani felt guilty about having passed the night with him. <laughs> Fatigue. One feels fatigue after walking a long distance, after dancing, after sexual activity. In this kind of fatigue, there's dizziness, perspiration, inactivity, the limbs yawning, and very heavy breathing. One day, Yashoda was chasing Krishna in the yard after he had offended her. After a while, Yashoda became very fatigued, and therefore she was perspiring, and her bunched hair became loosened. This is an instance of becoming fatigued because of working too much. <laughs> it's connected to Krishna, chasing Krishna. I would love to be done fatigued like that. Sometimes all the coward friends of Krishna, along with Balaram, danced together in some ceremony. At this time, the garlands on their necks would move and the boys would begin to perspire. Their whole bodies became wet from the ecstatic dancing. This is an instance of fatigue caused by dancing. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Ganto, 33rd chapter, verse 20, it is said that after enjoying love affairs with Krishna by dancing, embracing, and kissing, the gopis would sometimes become very tired, and Krishna, out of his causeless mercy and compassion, would smear their faces with his lotus hands. This is an example of fatigue caused by labor in the rasa dance. Laboring in the rasa dance. 
intoxication. It's interesting because in the spiritual world, everything is there. And what we find as reflections in this world are actually something that make us miserable, whereas the real pure form of all these things, whether it's conjugal attraction, whether it's intoxication as we're about to read, they make us blissful. That's the difference. You know, the material world is the opposite of Satchitananda. It's A, Sat, Achit, and Nirananda. That means temporary, ignorant, and mesorapalo, intoxication. When one becomes arrogant with false prestige due to drinking intoxicants or being too lustful, the voice becomes faulty, the eyes become swollen. <laughs> there are symptoms of redness on the body. There is a statement in Lita Madhava that Lord Balarev, intoxicated from drinking excessive quantities of honey, once began to address the ants. O king of the ants, why are you hiding yourselves in these holes? At the same time, he also addressed the king of heaven. O King Indra, you plaything of Sachi, why are you laughing? I'm now prepared to smash the whole universe, and I know that Krishna will not be angry with me. Then he addressed Krishna. My dear Krishna, tell me immediately why the whole world is trembling, why the moon has become elongated. And, O oh, you members of the Yadu dynasty, why are you laughing at me? Please give me back my liquors made of honey from the Kadamba flower. Uh, Siddha Rupa Goswami prays that Lord Balaram will be pleased with all of us while he is thus talking just like an intoxicated person. So there's intoxication in the spiritual world. If you hear about Krishna or Lord Balaram getting intoxicated, uh, it's not ignorance. But then you'll lose your desire to take intoxication. Just hearing about Krishna's pastimes and Balaram's pastimes and Radha and Krishna's loving exchanges, one becomes intoxicated. In this state of intoxication, Balaram felt tired and lay down for rest. Generally, those who are exalted personalities lie down when they feel intoxicated, whereas those who are mediocre laugh and sing during intoxication, and those who are lowly use vulgar language and sometimes cry. Such intoxication is manifested according to different ages and mentalities. Srila Rupa Goswami does not discuss further in this direction because there's no necessity for such a discussion. Sorry, but it's, for me, it's very humorous. So, in other words, if you find someone who's getting intoxicated in this material world, a high-class person who gets intoxicated goes to sleep, uh, second class just laughs and sings, and low class uses vulgar language, like four-letter words, or cries like craziness. There's another description of the symptoms of intoxication in the person of Sri Radharani after she saw Krishna. Sometimes she was walking hither and thither, sometimes she was laughing, sometimes she was covering her face, sometimes she was talking without any meaning, and sometimes she was praying to her associate gopis. Seeing these symptoms in Radharani, the gopis began to talk among themselves. Just see how Radharani has become intoxicated simply by seeing Krishna before her. So that's the Vibhava seeing Krishna. Intoxication is the uh, Vyavachari Bhava. This is an instance of ecstatic love and intoxication. Expressions of ecstatic love and pride may be the result of excessive wealth, exquisite beauty, a first-class residence, or the attainment of one's ideal goal. One is also considered proud when he does not care about the neglect of others. So, of course, I, that can also be applied in the material world, but we're interested in the spiritual ecstasies. Vilvamangala Thakur says, My dear Krishna, you are leaving me forcibly getting out of my clutches, but I shall be impressed by your strength only when you can fo go forcibly from the core of my heart. This is an instance of feeling pride and ecstatic love for Krishna. Once during the Rasa dance when Radharani left the arena and Krishna went to seek her out, one of the dear friends of Radharani addressed Krishna thus, My dear Krishna, you have been very much obliging in serving the form of our Sri Radharani, and now you have left all the other gopis in search for her. Please allow me to inquire how you want her to treat you. This is an instance of feeling pride on account of exquisite beauty. Sometimes Radharani felt pride within herself and said, Although the coward boys prepare nice flower garlands for Krishna, when I present my garland to him, he becomes struck with wonder and immediately accepts it and puts it on his heart. 
So the relationship of Radha and Krishna is the spiciest relationship. And she is called a uh, left-handed gopi, not because she writes with her left hand or eats with her left hand, because she has all these, like, what would be considered in ordinary circumstances, contrary emotions, like anger, or jealousy, etc. Whereas you have other gopis, like Chandravali, who don't have these contrary emotions. They're just very, very submissive, not proud at all. So Radharani pleases Krishna very much because of the uh, intricacies, uh, because of the uh, amazing varieties of ecstatic love that are there that she manifests more than anyone else. Variety is the mother of enjoyment, and Krishna enjoys the highest amount of varieties in association with Srimadhi Radharani. Similarly, in the 10th canto, 2nd chapter, verse 33 of Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, Lord Brahma says, My dear Madhusudana, a person who are pure devotees of your lordship, actually feel your ecstatic friendship, and as such, they are never vanquished by enemies. They know that they are always protected by you, and so they can matter-of-factly pass over the heads of their enemies without any care. In other words, one who has taken complete shelter under the lotus feet of the Lord is always proud of being able to conquer all enemies. One weaver at Mathura addressed Krishna in this way, My dear King of Vrindavan, I become so proud of your causeless mercy. Always, oh, cause his mercy. Whoops, I got too high here. Not high. Anyway, I page too quickly. Oh, cause his mercy upon me that I do not even count upon the mercy of the Lord of Ikunta, which is sought after by many great sages in deep meditation. In other words, although the yogis and great sages sit in meditation upon Lord Vishnu, who is residing in Vaikuntha, a devotee of Krishna is so proud that he does not consider such meditation to be very valuable. This feeling of pride is due to one's having achieved the highest goal of life, Krishna. Doubt. After Lord Brahma had stolen all the calves, cows, and coward boys from Krishna, he was trying to go away. But all of a sudden, he became doubtful about his stealing affairs and began to watch on all sides with his eight eyes. Lord Brahma has four heads, and therefore he has eight eyes. This is an instance of ecstatic love and doubt caused by stealing. <laughs> Similarly, just to please Krishna, Akrura stole the Shamantaka Mani, a stole a stone, sorry, which can produce unlimited quantities of gold, but later on he repented of stealing. This is another instance of ecstatic love for Krishna and doubt caused by stealing. <laughs> you see, everything's there in the spiritual world. Intoxication, stealing. It's amazing. It's not dry there. If you're feeling dry, it's because you're in this world. If you're feeling not inspired, it's because your consciousness is just in this world. When the king of heaven, Indra, was causing torrents of rain to fall on the land of Raj, he was advised to surrender himself to the lotus feet of Krishna. At that time, Indra's face became very dark because of doubt apprehension, it's like fear of something happening in the future, near future usually. When a person becomes disturbed in his heart by seeing lightning in the sky, by seeing a ferocious animal, or by hearing a tumultuous sound, his state of mind is called apprehensive. In such a state of apprehension, one tries to take shelter of something which provides safety. There may be standing of the hairs on the body, trembling of the body, and sometimes the committing of mistakes. And sometimes the body became, may become stunned. In the Pajabali, there's the following statement. My dear friend, Krishna's residence in the demoniac circle of Mathura under the supremacy of the king of demons, Kongsa, is causing me such worry or much worry. This is one instance of apprehending some danger to Krishna and ecstatic love for him. When Vrishasura appeared in Vrindavana as a bull, all of the gopis became greatly affected by the fear. Being perturbed in that way, they began to embrace the tamal trees. This is an instance of fear caused by a ferocious animal and of the search for shelter while remembering Krishna and ecstatic love. Now remember, a tamal tree has the same color complexion as Krishna. That's why they were embracing tamal trees. Upon hearing the jackals crying in the forest of Vrindavan, Mother Yashoda sometimes became very fearful about keeping Krishna under her vigilance. 
fearing that Krishna might be attacked by them. This is an instance of ecstatic love for Krishna and fear caused by a tumultuous sound. This kind of fear is a little different from being actually afraid. When one is afraid of something, he can still think of past and future. But when there is this kind of ecstatic apprehension, there is no scope for such thinking. Wow. Fight or flight. Intense emotion. Emotion is caused by something very dear or by something very detestable, by fire, by strong wind, by strong rainfall, by some natural disturbance, by the sight of a big elephant or by the sight of an enemy. When there is emotion caused by seeing something very dear, one can speak very swiftly and use kind words. When there is emotion caused by seeing something detestable, one cries very loudly. When there is emotion caused by seeing fire, one tries to flee. There may, be, there may also be trembling of the body, closing of the eyes, and tears in the eyes. When one becomes emotional on account of a strong wind, one tries to run very swiftly and rubs his eyes. When one is emotional because of rainfall, one takes an umbrella, and there is tension in the body. When there is an emotion due to a sudden disturbance, one's face becomes discolored, one becomes struck with wonder, and there is trembling of the body. If there is emotion from seeing an elephant, one may jump and show various signs of fear, and sometimes one may keep looking behind him. When there's emotion due to the presence of an enemy, one looks for a fatal weapon and tries to escape. Okay. When Krishna returned from the forest of Vrindavan, Mother Yashoda was so emotional on seeing her from seeing her son that milk began to flow from her breasts. This is an instance of emotion caused by seeing a dear object. In the tenth canto, 23rd chapter, verse 18 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadev Goswami informs King Pariksit, My dear king, the wives of the Brahmanas were usually very much attached to the glorification of Krishna, and they were always anxious to get an opportunity to see him. Because of this, when they heard that Krishna was nearby, they became very anxious to see him and immediately left their homes. This is an instance of emotional activity caused by the presence of someone very dear. So that's the whole story of the Wives of the Brahmins leaving their husbands in the middle of the sacrifice because Krishna wanted something to eat. When Putana, the demoniac witch, was struck down and killed by Krishna, Mother Yashoda was struck with wonder and began to cry emotionally. Oh, what is this? What is this? When she saw that her dear baby Krishna was playing on the chest of the dead demoniac woman, Mother Yashoda, at a loss what to do, began to walk this way and that. This is an instance of being emotional on account of seeing something ghastly. Huh. When Krishna uprooted the two Arjuna trees and Yashoda heard the sound of the trees crashing down, she became overcome with emotion and simply stared upward, being too bewildered to know what else to do. This is an instance of being emotional from hearing a tumultuous sound. When there was a forest fire in Vrindavan, all the coward men assembled together and desperately appealed to Krishna for protection. This is an instance of emotion caused by fire. The whirlwind demon known as Chanavarta once carried Krishna off from the ground and blew him all around, along with some very big trees. At that time, Mother Yashoda could not see her son, and she was so disturbed that she began to walk this way and that. This is an instance of emotion caused by severe wind. In the 10th canto, 25th chapter, verse 11 of Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a description of Indra's causing severe torrents of rain at Vrindavan. All the cows and coward boys became so afflicted by the wind and cold that they all gathered together to take shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna. This is an instance of emotion caused by severe rainfall. There were severe torrents of hail when Krishna was staying in the forest at Vrindavan. And the elderly persons bade him, Krishna, don't you move now. Even persons who are stronger and older than you cannot move. And you are just a little boy. Please, so please stay still. This is an instance of emotion caused by heavy hailing. When Krishna was chastised in Kali in the poisonous water of the Yamuna, Mother Yashoda began to speak emotionally. Oh, see how the earth appears to be trembling. There appears to be an earth tremor. And in the sky, tears are flying here and there. My dear son has entered into the poisonous water of the Yamuna. What shall I do now? This is an instance of emotion resulting from a natural disturbance. 
In the arena of Kamsa, when Krishna was attacked by big elephants, all the ladies present began to address him in this way. My dear boy, please leave this place immediately. Please leave this place immediately. Don't you see the big elephants coming to attack you? Your innocent gazing upon them is causing us too much perturbation. Krishna then told Mother Yashoda, My dear mother, don't be perturbed by the appearance of the elephants and horses that are so forcibly coming and raising dust, causing blindness to these lotus-eyed women. Let even the Keshi demon come before me. My arms will still be adequate for victory. So please don't be perturbed. In the Lita Madhava, a friend tells Mother Yashoda, how wonderful it is that when the Shankachuda demon, vast and strong as a great hill, attacked your Cupid-like beautiful son, there was no one present in Vrindavan to help. And yet the demon was killed by your little son. It appears to be due to the result of severe penances and austerities in your past lives that your son was saved in this way. In the same Lalita Madhava, there's an account of Krishna's kidnapping Rukmini at her royal marriage ceremony. At that time, all the princes present began to converse amongst themselves, saying, We have our elephants, horses, chariots, bows, arrows, and swords. So why should we be afraid of Krishna? Let us attack him. He is nothing but a lusty coward boy. He cannot take away the princess in this way. Let us all attack him. This is an instance of emotion caused by the presence of enemies. Srila Rupa Goswami is trying to prove by the above examples that in relationship with Krishna, there is no question of impersonalism. All personal activities are there in relationship with Krishna. Okay? And we will continue there tomorrow with madness. Just let me mark this so I know where we're going to continue. Intense emotions. Madness. Okay, madness. Okay, so we're going to stop and then take some questions. We have 29 people here watching. Wait one second. You are now allowed to unmute yourselves. Okay, who wants to ask a question? Okay, Mr. Radhapadma, you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. Hare Krishna, Gurudev, Dandavat Pranam. Whoops. What's your question? Uh, Gurudev, so yeah. uh, uh, I'm trying to understand uh, Anubhava and Babichar Bhava, difference between it and Sattvika Bhava and Stai Bhava. So is it like if, uh, un if uh, there is no stimulus, and uh, without any warnings, uh, emotions comes up. So that is Vabhichari Bhava, uh, which is similar. No, there's always, a, there's always a stimulus. You don't experience an emotion without a stimulus. Even if the stimulus, even if the stimulus is a remembrance of Krishna, that's a stimulus. So in Vabhichari Bhava, there is a remembrance of Krishna or Krishna's activity. Yeah, you know, there's still Vibhava. The, there always has to be a stimulus for any of the emotions to be expressed. So, how do we differentiate Anubhava and Vabhichari Bhava? Oh, the, the difference is that Anubhava are voluntary expressions. For example, if I see the deities and I start dancing like voluntarily, okay. that's. And uh, Vyabhachari are involuntary. So uh, in Anubhava, there and, is and the much more intense. And Anubhava, Anubhava, Anubhava is voluntary. You can stop it if you want. You know, even though I may have the impetus to dance, I can stop myself from dancing, or the impetus to cry. Woohoo! I can stop myself from crying. So, but in Vyabhachari Bhavas are not controllable by a person. Okay, and uh, that means Anubhava is consequential. Uh, yeah, anu, anu means what follows, basically. It's consequential to the Vibhava. But you can have Vibhava go directly to a uh, Vyabhachari Bhava. Okay, where one cannot control voluntarily. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's much more intense. intense. 
Anubhav is intense, but you can actually hold back, hold it back. Mm-hmm. You know, any of the Anubhavas, you know, you could think about like one is called drooling at the mouth. You just close your mouth. You put a piece. You can put a piece of tape on your mouth. So. <laughs> But you know, when you talk about really intense emotions like anxiety or fear, the intensity of the uh, Vyabhachari Bhavas are much more, much more intense, you know, maybe hundreds of times or at least tens of times much more intense than the Anubhavas. Okay. Um, so Gurudev, how about Sattvika Bhava and Stai Bhava? Sat- yeah, the sattvika bhavas are things that are always there, but sometimes they're manifest, sometimes they're not manifest. There's us, us the sattvika bhavas, there's eight, eight of them. They're part of your constitutional nature. That means in sthai bhava as well as in sattvika bhava? Uh, uh, no, sthai bhava is something different. Sthai bhava, I mean, all right, let's say, you're jumping ahead, but let's say sthai bhava, let's say my sthai bhava is the mood of... Uh, love for Krishna like a parent. Let's give that example. Yes. So I feel very affectionate to Krishna in that mood. That's my stai bhava. That's my mood. So, so one remains in that bhava. Yes, that's, that's constant. No. So, that's constant. The stai, stai bhava is the steady bhava. You know, that's really what it means. It's the constant mood. Let's say I have a parental affection towards Krishna. So that's my mood. That's that's my mood towards Krishna. Now the other bhavas are either stimulations for it, or ecstatic expressions of that particular bhava. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, like we'll get to stai bhava yeah. later on. This right now we're at vyabhachari bhavas, and the stai bhava is the last uh, in the category of bhavas. Just little clarification on sattvika bhava. So in sattvika yeah. bhava, there is. A- uh, devotee still uh, experiences bhava in a certain yeah. relationship in parental or conjugal or well it's, it's all connected to the relationship with krishna all the different expressions of love are all connected to the stai bhava okay because uh, you know your mood your your symptoms of ecstasy are always connected to your to your stai bhava to your constant emotion let's say all right let, let's say i'm a friend of krishna so my ecstasies will be very much connected to that like if i'm missing krishna because he's not taking care of the cows today or something like that uh and then it's connected to the relationship you understand all the ecstasies are actually connected to although they may be similar between the different relationships they're all connected, you know, uh, the word for relationship is rati, actually. Uh, rati also means taste. But the, uh, not quite taste, it means a relationship. Anyway, it means a relationship. But sometimes you have, when someone has, yeah, yeah, it means relationship. Rati means relationship, not taste. Rasa is taste. So anyway, so, so when one has a particular relationship, it's reflected in the different bhavas, you know, different things stimulate you. For example, you know, if I, if I was a mother of Krishna and I saw, uh, I saw a pay Krishna, I would, you know, want to feed Krishna my breast milk or something like that. Mm-hmm. So the, the manifestation would be different. Or if I was a gopi, of course, that's hard to believe. But if I was a gopi and I was to see Krishna, then I would feel like dancing with him. You know, just I mean, these are rough examples. If I was a cow, then if I saw a Krishna, I'd want to give him some milk. <laughs> you know, it's just like I want to run after Krishna. So it just anyway, they're all connected. All these different bhavas are connected. Main thing is the Vyabhachari bhavas are much more intense and uh, they're unexpected when they manifest themselves. It's not that you're gonna not you're gonna think, you know, when I see Krishna today, I'm gonna manifest my madness. <laughs> you don't plan it. 
But the Vyabhicha, the uh, Anubhava, you can actually plan. You can say, when I see Krishna today, I'm going to dance with him. I'm going to roll on the ground with it in ecstasy. You know, you can plan these things. And also you can hold them back. Yeah. But the uh, Vyabhachari Bhavas, you can't hold back like that. And the Stai Bhavas is just your, your constitutional re relationship with Krishna. Your mood of your constitutional relationship. Your emotion of the constitutional relationship. Yes. Okay? Okay, Guru Dev, thank you very thank much. You. Anyway, all I know is that I'm not this body. I haven't realized that very much either. I still think I'm my car, what to speak of thinking I'm the body. I still think I, I still think I'm the my mobile phone. And I, and if and if someone you know, by every time I get a new mobile phone I feel like I have a new fresh youth. Yeah, so Someone just got me a new mobile phone, and I just feel like I'm like 20 years old again. So, so my identification, my identification with is with that. So I can't really talk about Stai Bhava, Anu Bhava, Vyabhachari Bhava, Hastasattvika Bhava. And when I when I see a, a new computer, I I have. Uh, symptoms of ecstasy, that's my v -bhava. <laughs> Or a new computer program, that's a new deepana. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so these are very high topics. I, but this is just so we can understand what's coming in the future. I appreciate these great devotees. It's not that, it's not that you should just tell your wife today, you know, oh, I just had this sattvika bhava today. <laughs> I just, my vyabhachari bhava, you know. It's not like it's not like that. It's just like these are very advanced stages of devotional service. I, sometimes when devotees study the nectar devotion, they pretty much well, they may go to this stage, but not too this page, but not too much further. <laughs> but this is. To me, it gets, it gets more and more wonderful the more, more we go through the nectar of devotion. We're about halfway through right now. But it gets really amazing towards the end when you get to the mixing of rasas, or the improper mixing of rasas, the proper mixing of rasas, the indirect rasas. It's actually a very nectarine, as Prabhupada would say. Or I would say, nectarine. <laughs> so, who else has a question? Thank you, Guru. Okay. Guru Dev? Yeah. Uh, perhaps Krishna Leela Mataji has a question first. No, you can go. You can go for ladies. Go ahead, Mataji. Ladies first. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Guru Dev. Please accept my humble obeisances. Jai. All glory to God. So, your question? Yes, uh, Gurudev, my question is about actually Maya, you know, Maya um, in the sense that uh, when we are enthusiastically serving and uh, doing all the services and loving Krishna and feeling the STC as well uh, a little bit. Um, uh, but my question is that sometimes uh, the feeling of uh, dizziness, uh, sorry, not dizziness, laziness, uh, excessive sleeping and all this uh, bit where it, is it possible that some devotees were saying Maya will always be around you to capture you to pull you back from uh, serving so uh, yeah I mean as long as you're not a pure devotee Maya Maya has two uh, tendencies going and keeping she's always looking to throw you back when you turn your back to her it's like it's almost like a wrestling match that you always have to keep your eye on your opponent. As soon as you turn your back on him, he just like throws you to the ground. So one has to be very, very alert all the time to make sure the Maya doesn't throw us. And that means being intelligent, knowing, uh, knowing the philosophy, Samanda Gyan and Abhideya Gyan, uh, knowing the philosophy enough so we can identify Maya, because Maya comes in different shapes. I was just reading in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam about this demon named Shalva who had an airplane. And it was actually, you couldn't tell whether it was here, whether it was there. 
and was very bewildering when he was attacking Dwarka. So Maya's like that. You can't tell whether she's here or she's there. And uh, one has to be very much alert like that. Uh, so that's the point, the alert. Okay. And I think Mr. Gopal Cohn has a question. Thank you, Gurudev. That's an um, interesting spiritual name, you know, Gopal Cohn does. What does Cohn mean in Sanskrit? Means bad tennis player. Really? <laughs> and maybe it's the name of the Holy Dom or something like that. So what, so what, you have a question? So you were talking about the different bhavas, uh, the, the levels and varieties of stimulations, and you were teasing a little bit about mobile phones and computers and cars. Um, yeah. But, um, and excuse me for saying, but every, everything that you have that you mentioned, you use 100% in Krishna's service. So I can't say that, and perhaps not many of us can, but it's pretty obvious um, that the products that you have, you're using 100% in Krishna's service, actually beyond the capacity of most human bodies. You know, <laughs> 25, eight. Beyond normal um, human capacity, you know, empowered beyond, beyond any other normal human being. Uh, with a single bound, you know, can jump over <laughs> buildings. So my question is, my question is, um, these so, things... So when you go you to Comic-Con, you can dress as me. Okay. Thank you, Gurudev. I pr appreciate that permission. <laughs> so what's the I'll question? Uh, so when you feel some sort of uh, attraction or attachment or some sort of I don't know, some emotion towards this, this item that you're using, a cell phone, a, 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 a car, or whatever, isn't there um, something beyond just the material taste because you're using it so much for Krishna? As long as it's a nice car. <laughs> <laughs> some, car some cars I have, I exhibit animosity towards. So, Why is no, that actually, to, seriously speaking, to be attached to one's paraphernalia, yes. But if one accepts more than necessary in the name of serving Krishna, it can be actually a uh, cause of deviation. Mm -hmm. So one has to be very careful. Because we all know that Achahara Prayasas Chapa Chapa Niyamagraha. So in the name of uh, Yukta Vairagya, one can become very Yukta and very little Vairagya. So one has but, to be careful about collecting too much. So many computers do I have today? So many more will I have tomorrow? So let's just say an example of gratitude. You walk out of your house and you look up the hill and you see that there's a car there and you know you can jump in that car anytime you want and go visit any well-wisher, disciple or whatever to encourage them in Krishna consciousness. And you feel some gratitude. Krishna has provided this facility for me yeah, that's to good. be able to do my service. Is there is that a kind of bhava or kind of uh, taste? Yeah, if you if you've seen it belongs to Krishna rather than yourself. If you think Krishna has given this to me, it's mine. Then it, then that's not a spiritual. If you think Krishna <laughs> is lending me this servant. And I'm grateful that I can serve him. Yes, that's that's actually a spiritual problem. Or if you're thinking, why the heck did Krishna give me this lousy car? Was he giving me something better than that? That's not spiritual. Okay, I think enough humor for tonight. Thank Maybe you, Greg. To, to end now? Okay, we'll see everybody uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow evening, all glories to his divine grace, Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada, Ki.